Great, so welcome everybody. My name is Shane Moore from the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. It's great to be able to welcome you all here today to do our webinar um, about professional master's programmes from the Faculty of Forestry. So today we're going to focus on our four professional programmes, tell you more about them, as well as the many opportunities that you'll find uh, with forestry at UBC. We're also going to talk about the admissions process, give you some advice on how to apply, and we're also going to answer as many of your questions as possible. So if you have any questions today, um, please let us know by typing into the Q&A box. So I'm going to pause the chat for the moment, but if you use the, the Q&A box, um, you can let us know your questions. Also, you can upvote questions. So if you see a question that someone else has posted and you like that one, make sure that you upvote it and we'll, uh, we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Before we dive in, I do, do just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we're broadcasting today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. And as we're guests on this land, it's a real honour for us to be able to live here, to work and to learn on these lands. And as you learn more about UBC, um, I'd also encourage you to learn more about the First Nations of Canada, uh, particularly the Musqueam people on whose territory UBC Vancouver is located. So if you, haven't, if you haven't had a chance yet, um, or you'd like to learn more, I've just been, I'm just going to post a couple of links into the, into the chat um, to get you started on that. Um, we have a really amazing team of presenters today, a um, really great panel. Um, I'm not going to introduce everybody um, right now, but you're going to hear from, from this team today, and they're going to be telling you, telling you more about their programmes, um, more about what's going on across the faculty and just give you some insight into what it's like to be a student at UBC Forestry. So we'll meet everybody shortly. Um, but before then, I do just want to speak a little bit about UBC as a whole. The Faculty of Forestry is one of 12 faculties at UBC Vancouver. And um, this is a picture of our Vancouver campus. Um, we're located about 30 to 40 minutes by bus from downtown Vancouver. It's, um, it's a really amazing place to, to study um, and, and to learn. Um, not only because of um, the amazing environment that, that we have, but also because UBC is really a global centre for research and teaching. We're consistently ranked as one of the top 20 public universities in the world. So you'll be learning from some of the best professors and be working alongside um, some really great colleagues and some really great students. Some of the best and brightest minds are at, are at UBC. We have um, just over 10,000, well, about 10,500 um, graduate students at UBC, um, and they come from across Canada and also around the globe. So it's a really diverse uh, graduate student community. Um, I think around 37% of our graduate students are from outside of Canada. Um, so it's a really, it's a really great, great mix. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're surrounded by forest, we're surrounded by the ocean and, and, and the mountains in, in, in the distance. UBC's Faculty of Forestry itself is, is ranked as one of the top three forestry schools in the world. Um, we have really world-class uh, facilities with a focus on experiential learning opportunities, which allows you the opportunity to engage um, with real world, real world issues. UBC Forestry has over 1,500 students, of which um, over 300 are graduate students. You can see a picture here of the Forest Sciences Centre, which is um, a, a real highlight on campus. It's one of my favourite places to be on campus. You can see on the right hand side um, a picture of the inside of the building of, of the atrium. And even when you're inside, um, the building it feels like you're outside with the with the glazed roof and um the wooden the wooden tree like can canopy so it's a really awesome place to to learn and to study 
UBC Forestry also has two research forests, um, the Alex Fraser and the Malcolm Knapp Research Forest, where students can enhance their classroom learning with field studies. And also researchers can establish projects requiring forest, forested environments. We also have the Centre for Advanced Wood Processing, um, which is Canada's National Centre for Education, Training and Technical Assistance for the wood products manufacturing industry and home to North America's first robotic CNC timber processor. So these are, the, these are examples of the facilities and the resources that you have access to as a UBC forestry student. So these are the four professional master's programs that we're going to talk about today. And before we hear more, I just want to explain a little bit more about what a professional master's program is, because it's a little bit different from, from other types of, of graduate program. And this could be useful to you if you're early on in your, in your research, early in your decision making process. But a professional master's essentially is, you know, what it says, it's professionally orientated. So it gives you the the skills and the knowledge that you'll need to start your professional career in this sector strongly. Um, we have a set curriculum for each program. So you'll move through the, through the program and it has a set program length. Um, these programs are also cohort based, which is really, really good because you'll be learning um, with the same group of people as you move through the program. Um, you'll become friends, that becomes your network as you, as you start your career too. Um, another characteristic of a pro professional master's programme is that you would complete it with a final paper or a capstone project rather than a sort of a long uh, thesis um, that you might find in other, in other uh, graduate programmes. So these are some characteristics of our professional master's programmes. But let's hear more, um, starting with the Masters of Geomatics for Environmental Management. So I'll hand it over now to Professor Nicholas Coops. Great, thanks Shane and uh, welcome everyone to this call and it's a great pleasure to talk to you about the programs and hopefully entice you to deciding that UBC is a good fit for you. So uh, the master's program that I am the director of is the Masters of Geomatics for Environmental Management. Um, geomatics is, is, the, is generally the term we use for measurements on the earth's surface. So it involves things like remote sensing, GIS, GPS, mapping, and how you use all of that information that we get today to look at important ecological and um, management questions, both in forests, but more broadly as well. And it's worth noting that we have students from all sorts of disciplines coming into MGEM, everything from social science, we've had lawyers and medical doctors uh, joining the program through to people that have done environmental science, geography, forestry, or other courses like that. So to give you a little bit of a sense about the nine month program that we have, you start off by learning about environmental management concepts and landscape ecology. That sort of sets the scene about how you think about the environments and how geospatial data might be able to help manage these issues that we have. You then learn the basics and advanced topics of geomatics. So you do both basic and advanced remote sensing, geographic information systems, you learn spatial statistics, you do a fair bit of coding and learn how to use R and Python, and as Shane says, you work on a proposal throughout the nine months on a research topic of your choice. You don't do a large amount of research because these are professional programs, but you do get to play with data and apply it to a particular problem that you like. In addition to all of those fundamental courses you learn about geomatics, you also do the professional development courses. There are four of those, and that really puts your interest in geomatics into some sort of professional context. So you learn about things like project management, entrepreneurship, leadership, and policy. So the idea would be at the end of the program at nine months, you can go back and work as a consultant or work within a government department as a manager around how you would go and utilize these geospatial skills to look at the problems that you're, you're interested in, be they in the forestry environment, maybe in the aquatic environment, an urban environment, Whatever, whatever urban environment you choose to go and do that. We're really proud of our past graduates. Virtually all of our past graduates over the last five years have been employed, working for the government, NGOs, international and beyond. And then while, we're, while you're in the program, we have many of them come back and talk to you. So we have career fairs where you hear about what past people have done. We've got workshops on drones and collecting imagery and other different topics that you can pick 
and then we organize those workshops for you. And last, I'll just say, we do all get to meet you with a bit of a retreat. So we actually start in mid-August and we all go away together for five days. We have guest speakers and we all get to build that cohort that Shane talked about. We go into the research forest so you can sort of understand the local environment of British Columbia. Then you come back and start the program. Thanks, Shane. Okay, uh, I guess I'm up next. Uh, my name is Ken Byrne. I'm the uh, coordinator for the uh, Master's Sustainable Forest Management Program. Uh, this is a 10 month course based master's program, and it's uh, particularly targeted for those who are in interested in, the, in professional forestry as a career. So uh, it is accredited with the, both Canadian and uh, US uh, forestry accreditation boards. So coming out of this program, uh, you have all the competencies and requirements to then uh, proceed with uh, all the uh, all the uh, processes to become a professional forester. Usually takes about two years after you uh, graduate from the program. Um, we start off and uh, it says there July. Uh, you do start off in July with uh, some pre-reading and uh, similar to the uh, geomatics course we uh, begin with uh, a two week uh, concentrated course in the end of August. And uh, one week is here uh, on campus and we visit various sites around the Vancouver area. And then the second week we uh, go to, in this case, Nelson, but it could be other areas of the province. Uh, so we spend a week in Nelson, it's a small cohort and um, it, it enables you to uh, build friendships and uh, build uh, relationships that often last uh, well into your career. We have many uh, former MSFM graduates who come back and, and visit the class to uh, give guest presentations and describe the kind of work that they're doing. So you're really only limited by your interest. Forestry is a broad field. Uh, we have uh, students who are interested in not only uh, professional forestry for industry, some go into government, some become consultants of their own, Others get into uh, urban forestry, conservation. So uh, the, the program is really centered around uh, two capstone courses, one in the first term that focuses on a site plan. Uh, you can see some students there in the top right corner uh, working on one of the site plans there. Uh, we, we visit the site before it's harvested, uh, and get all kinds of information about that and then revisit it after it's been harvested. In the second term, uh, we work with uh, uh, community forests uh, and, uh, and industry on a landscape level project, which is a nine credit capstone course. And uh, throughout the program, uh, there are all kinds of supporting courses that uh, feed into that. So there's uh, core courses in forest economics, uh, forest policy, uh, geomatics, land information systems, and we also, uh, a really important part of the program is, is fostering uh, your development as a, as a professional. So we have uh, supporting workshops and modules in project management, uh, conflict resolution, and uh, everything that you would need um, to become a, a competent professional in the field. Thanks very much, Shane. Okay, so it's... My turn now, I think. I don't know if everybody can see me. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for being here. I'm so happy to see so many of you coming from different parts of the world. So I'm the director of the Master of International Forestry. My name is Intu Bodhi Artono. I'm originally from Indonesia, but I've been living in different parts of the world um, uh, for the last 30 years, I could say. Um, so this Master of International Forestry is actually a program that's trying to understand uh, and deal with different complex forest landscapes. It provides the knowledge and skills and different ways of um, addressing these global forest challenges. We focus a lot on the social, environmental and economic issues. Um, and we also try to uh, understand also different land use change, policy and governance of the landscapes and also to, to understand really the relations between forest and people in those different landscapes. 
um, and if you, if you already look at our website, we, we have also a very important part of the program that is the, the directed studies or placements or internship, we could also say. Um, so the whole program is, is actually 10 months only. So eight months, everybody will be on campus at UBC. And we have a lot of uh, practical activities as well. We have a lot of guests. We go to visit different indigenous communities. We visit different private sector. And we talk with different government um, representatives. Basically, we try to understand what are the different challenges that um, we have to face in the future in the landscapes where there are a lot of different kind of use of forests. So forest could be productive forest, it could be agroforestry, it could be protected areas, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we try to use a lot of practical approach by uh, working together with all these different stakeholders in the landscapes. And a lot of our professors in the program, they come from different parts of the world. We have a lot of people coming from uh, Europe, from North America, from Asia, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, one of the interesting part of the program is to be able to do an internship or a director studies in different parts of the world. Here on the slides, as you can see, we have um, several students going to Indonesia, to Australia, to Northern British Columbia, working together with NGOs like WWF Conservation International, WCF um, Wildlife Conservation Society, or with private sector, with big companies that are specializing in urban paper or in loggings or anything that deals in the landscapes. So some of the other um, internship could be also with um, working with the government or it could also be with communities. So here the students are, are actually meeting a lot with some of the elders in some of the um, indigenous communities in British Columbia. And we also visited some of the remoter area in Indonesia and some others went to Cambodia or India. And this is a really interesting uh, project that students could do at the end of their program. So I guess uh, um, if you're interested in um, understanding or um, being able to understand different ways of knowing and different ways of learning, uh, I guess this program would be um, an interesting program to, to, to take. So we are looking for students from different disciplines, from different countries, so that you can also share your knowledge with everybody else um, in the program. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Cecil Kunanedijk, and I'm the program director of uh, the fourth of these exciting programs, the Master of Urban Forestry Leadership. And this is a, it's a pretty new program. We have had uh, one year now of, of running it. It's a 14 month online program. Uh, there is a little uh, component where people actually have a chance to meet as well at the end of the program, but most of it is online, starting in, in summer uh, with an online course, um, which really gets you up to speed on the topic of this program, which is urban forestry. And as uh, some of you may know, there's a lot of focus these days on greening cities, adapting them to climate change, making them healthier, uh, planting a lot of trees, so we need professionals who can lead those programs, not just in Canada and North America, but but all over the world. So one of the really key components of the program is, is actually this international focus. And what we do is we combine the best of urban forestry knowledge, taught by, uh, by the excellent faculty at UBC, but also uh, many different guest lecturers. And we combine that then with leadership uh, courses. So we look at things like uh, sustainability and leadership, entrepreneurship, project management to really uh, prepare people for a, a career as, as a leader in the greening of, uh, of cities. And, and people typically would, would end up in uh, uh, city municipal positions, but also, for example, in not-for-profits, other government positions, consultancy jobs, and so forth. Next one, please. Yeah, these are just some of the images to show you what urban forestry is all about. And as you see, uh, we're uh, mostly interacting on, uh, on online platforms, but there's really a strong uh, cohort feel as well. We really have noticed that the peer learning, uh, a lot of the, the students actually come with experience to this program, have done urban forestry work in the past, is really a strong component uh, as well. So we're looking for people, for people, students from many different backgrounds, uh, either people who have urban forestry or forestry experience, but also people from planning backgrounds, um, ecology, social sciences, because we really want to reflect the interdisciplinarity of, of this field of urban forestry. 
So we're really excited to, um, yeah, to run the next year with hopefully some of you in the program, and we'll be happy to answer some questions later. Hi, everyone. Um, so the next few slides, uh, I only have a few, two slides to go over, and I will be providing the general program requirements and how to apply. Next, please. Oh, thank you. So the uh, general admission requirements for these programs are quite similar in terms of the GPA academic requirement. Uh, for those applying from Canada and US, we're looking for an overall B plus range in the senior level courses. And for those students applying from international countries, it's based on the overall average. So it's the cumulative average of your bachelor's degree. And for specific program prerequisites, I would encourage you to visit the um, individual program admissions page to tell you a little bit more of what specific program requirements we're looking for, such as MGEM. Uh, they usually like students to have some background in statistics. And, um, also for the English language proficiency, students um, applying from outside of Canada in which English is not the primary language of instruction will be required to provide a TOEFL, IELTS or an acceptable English language proficiency. And I'll be putting the links in the chat box later on minimum requirements for our program, uh, which is different from faculty of grad studies um, minimum requirements. And uh, for any specific questions related to your application, or if you have a little bit more um, questions that may not be in the FAQs or in, on our web page, you can also email us at forestry.cbm at ubc.ca. Um, Rebecca, my colleague, and I will be hosting um, some weekly Zoom drop-in sessions starting this week on Wednesdays at 10 in the morning Pacific Standard Time. And just a reminder that our application is applications are due March 15th. Um, and so that's March 15th, midnight Pacific Standard Time. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us and we'd be happy to chat with you. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, lots of, of information there. Really great overview of the, of the professional programs. Um, you can let us know any questions that you have. So if you if you type in to the Q&A um, and let us know any, any questions, I can read them out and ask, ask the panelists um, any questions. So do, do let us know. We did have some questions that were submitted um, beforehand as part of the as part of the registration. So I was going to start um, with those first of all. Um, the first one is about the MGEM program. Um, and this, this question comes in from uh, Krunal, and they ask, how does the um, GEM program intertwine um, with de de development economics and sustainable land management in terms of economics? So, um, Nicholas, I don't know if you could, if you could speak to that. Um, well, I'm welcome to, you're welcome to email me and we can follow up with this offline if my answer is not appropriate enough. Um, but there's really, you know, there's not much economics in MGEM. It's not designed to be, uh, to provide you that skill set. So um, in terms of, uh, of, you know, what is covered would be things like ecological goods and services. How do you evaluate ecological goods and services and how do you use geospatial data to help address those types of issues. We wouldn't actually teach um, economics as a core um, course of that or a core component of that program, however. That's great, thanks. Um, and, and another question that's come in here is just a, just a general question around like how, how, how long is the, is the admissions process um, I don't know if Lee, if you could speak to that. You know, if someone does apply, um, you know, before just before the deadline or in in the next couple of weeks, what does that timeline look like in terms of hearing back and getting an admissions decision? Sure. Um, so our committees usually meet about a few weeks. I would say a couple of weeks after the deadline closes. So March fifteenth closes. Um, I know it's usually early April and sometimes earlier, depending on when the application have been um, evaluated by 
us, the coordinators, and if everything's complete, uh, we forward it to the committee. Uh, we have made some early offers uh, for those who have submitted completed applications, and if the application is very strong as well. Um, so the turnaround time could be about two to three weeks, depending on if it's a strong application. And um, you should hear probably by early April for the for um, the offers. And you have about um, 10 days to get back to us on whether or not you accept or not. And there's a program deposit payment that is required as well. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Lee. You're um, uh, Nicholas, did you see the question there from, from Michael around the M MGM program? Okay, so I'm just reading that now. Regarding the MGM program, are the geomatics and management theories taught focused on a forest environment, or is there a multimedia approach to different uh, concepts? So yes, very much, uh, much, much broader than forestry. So we are within a forestry faculty, um, but the geomatics is taught much broader than that. So um, in the classes, you'll do, as I mentioned, urban, marine examples, there's um, agricultural examples. Uh, and students come from a wide variety of backgrounds. So, you know, it's not like we're only teaching forestry students. So you know, there's a, certainly a terrestrial um, focus, po po slightly more than a, a marine one for sure. But I think uh, in general, it is, um, it is certainly more than just forestry. Great, thank you. And great question, Michael, thank, thanks for that one. Um, just a, another question here from, from Yumna who says, um, what are some of the softwares used in the MIF and urban forestry leadership programs? So what are, what are some of the softwares that are, that are used? Does anyone want to want to take that one? I can jump in for uh, for the Master of Urban Forestry Leadership. So we use um, uh, a range of softwares, um, including, for example, for geomatics, we use uh, some GIS software for our uh, introduction to geomatics course. Otherwise, we actually really ask students to, uh, to use, for example, their uh, presentation skills, communication skills in different ways. And that also requires and of course, using different software products. But, but I would say in terms of specific software, it's mostly the, the geospatial software that will be, uh, will be used. That's yeah, great. So, so maybe for the MIF, I could add that um, it depends on the student because uh, in the MIF program, students come from different uh, discipline and they have different interests. So uh, it all depends on their projects and with whom they're going to be working for their directed studies or internship. So some people will be using landscape scenario software like um, Stella or Vincent, the modeling uh, of uh, future landscapes, or they could be using actors network analysis, for example, to try to understand the policy and governance in that landscape, who's actually uh, having the power in that specific area and they could be using en vivo and all those different things so students are usually able to take um, some of these classes uh, as well for their professional development and we do have a few of those classes during the the seminar which is the, every thursday um, in the in the program so we can be bringing even other kind of um, i don't know software or things that are the student thing that is useful for them so yeah that's great, thank you. Um, I, I, Ken, I was I was wondering. Um, there's a question here from Ken Yi, um, just about our graduates from the four programs guaranteed to be registered professional foresters. Foresters, I think you were typing an answer, or but but would you be able to take that one live? Could you answer that yeah, one? Yeah, I, I was looking for a place to type, and it wasn't letting me do it. So I'm happy to oh, sorry. It live. <laughs> um, so uh, the MSFM program is uh, the only one that is accredited to uh, become a registered professional forester. So there are certain core competencies that are required by the Canadian um, Accreditation, uh, Canadian Forestry Accreditation Board and uh, the Society of American Foresters. Um, and uh, does it guarantee that you will become a professional forester? Um, once you graduate, there's certain steps that you need to take, uh, professional steps that you need to take with each uh, forestry uh, organization. So you need to go through um, basically an articling period where you um, move through in the Canadian example, you move through six modules, uh, you do assignments, you do tests, 
And then uh, it usually, that process usually takes two years. Uh, you work under a uh, sponsoring uh, registered professional forester. Um, most students, uh, when they start the program, uh, they can, there are some uh, professional foresters in the faculty, myself included. Um, so you can start off with one of us. And then as you move out into your uh, uh, working uh, life, you can, you're free to switch to whoever you're working most closely with, or you can stay with uh, the one you start with. But uh, yeah, to answer that question, it's it's accredited, but to be to say it's guaranteed, well, really that's up to you. What how you uh, uh, manage your prof uh, your professional development after that. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, there's a question here from from Annie um, with regards to the MSFM. Will we have the chance to learn about indigenous practices in forestry? Is there any collaboration with ind indigenous communities? Um, Harry, would you be able to take that one? Thanks, Shane. So for those of you, this is my first chance. I work with Ken. I'm the director for the MSFM program. And Annie, yes, I mean, that's the short answer. We have both Indigenous speakers that come in to the MSFM program. We have course material, and we're developing more course material around it. And part of that's a reflection of just how important that is becoming here in BC. I would note that most of our experience here is within a British Columbia context, um, as opposed to the MIF program where you'll get the opportunity to work elsewhere. And I even, again, I guess the question is, um, you know, within the limited confines of the time spent with the program, there are even opportunities, I think, to work more closely. I do know that as Ken mentioned, one of the things that you work on are developing landscape level plans. And indeed this year, one of the clients that their students are working with is an indigenous community up in the interior. Can I, Thanks. Can I, add, can I add to that, Shane? Um, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, so in the MIF program, we work a lot with different indigenous communities. Um, uh, with the last few years, we've been also trying to connect as well with the British Columbia First Nations, but a lot of our professors have been working in Asia, Africa, and, and South America, so we do have even indigenous student in our program uh, from uh, Nicaragua and other countries as well, and Tibet and other countries. So, so it is a very interesting um, exchange that people can have even during in the, in the class, but we also take students to meet with these indigenous communities and with the elders as well. And uh, basically trying to, to understand how people have a different ways of, of um, knowing and learning together, right? And so, some of the uh, field work or some of the internship that people can do is actually working and living with some of the indigenous communities, whether if it's in Indonesia or Cameroon or India or, or elsewhere. So thanks very much. That's great. That, thank you. Thanks so much for that, for that insight. Um, and thanks everyone for the great questions you've been posting so far. Um, do let us know if there's any, any other questions um, for the panel. Um, I, I had a question um, for the panel. I know everyone listening today will be thinking about applying. Some of them may have started their application. And I mean, Lee gave us a great overview of that, of that process, but I'm just wondering, um, you know, as, as professors, as, as uh, program directors, what are, what are some of the things that you look for in, in an application? Um, is, are there any things that you're looking for in, in particular in terms of experience or in terms of, you know, how the, the statement of interest is, is written? Are, are there any sort of things that, that you look for when, you, when you're looking at applicants for your programs? Does anyone want to get, get things started on that one? I can, I can start saying, I think that that's a really great, uh, great question. So because our program, the Urban Forestry program is, is so interdisciplinary, uh, we don't limit ourselves to people specific disciplines so we really look if people can make the link between their past education and the field of urban forestry so will they show a passion for the field will they show that they've been thinking about how they actually are moving forward from their pre previous education and practice to to urban forestry so actually that statement of intent and and expressing kind of how you envision your journey as an urban forester an urban forestry leader is really where i start looking usually yeah, and, and for the MI program, we actually look for passionate people, <laughs> people who had experience or whether if it's a, a really work experience. A lot of our students have several years of work experience, mid-career, but we also have a few 
people who just uh, freshly graduated, but we basically would like to have this opportunity of exchanging, isn't it, or the different experience, whether if it's a real work or if it's just an internship or if it's a volunteering and things like that, because I think that will enrich the exchange uh, between the students and also basically for people who are interested in learning from others. And because a lot of the activities that we do are teamwork, right? Because in real life, uh, that's what, what it's supposed to be anyway, right? And people have to work with different people from different disciplines, different culture and different countries. So, so in the MI program, we do uh, be um, interested in, in a lot of people with a lot of interest, a lot of passion and who will be willing to be going to those remoter area uh, in, in different parts of the world as well, because uh, mm -hmm. we have a lot of opportunities for those people to work internationally in the future and work with different partners in the future. So, yeah. That's great. Well, I guess it's my turn next. And I think I, I won't repeat what Cecil and Intu said. You know, those are all the kind of qualities that we look for in, um, you know, students that we want to have come to UBC. I guess from my view, a past experience um, in forestry isn't absolutely necessary, but for us, you know, the kind of students that are going to be graduating, you're going to be working kind of at this fascinating intersection between forests and people in society. You know, you're going to be equipped to go out, um, as Ken pointed out, you could work for NGOs, you could work for government, you could work for industry. Um, but it's very much going to be going and working out in the field in these areas. So it's got to be something that I think that you would enjoy, both kind of working with working in the field of natural resources, working with people. I guess the one thing I'd like to emphasize for everybody um, would be, you know, this is very much a professional program. Um, you do get the opportunities, as Nicholas mentioned, to do a bit of research. We try and create projects where you can sort of build your knowledge, but it's not going to be a research program per se. This is really about sending you out so you're qualified to hit the ground running and kind of um, start doing things. And I think Ken would like to add something to that too. Ken? Yeah, just um, a little bit about, uh, you know, more about the background, the diversity of background that we uh, get coming into the program. I mean, you know, example this year, I mean, we have people coming in from uh, finance, from medical fields, uh, military even, and uh, they bring in a really rich set of um, skills uh, that can contribute really well to forestry. And one of the things that employers, I think, really like about our graduates, I mean, they all get, uh, they, they're getting jobs and our, uh, the employers I talk to really like the program and really like our graduates because they, they, they are more mature and they have this, these, all these other soft skills that are needed in forestry. And what we're providing are the technical forestry skills and a little bit more about the professionalism. And uh, it, it provides employers with, um, you know, really mature and capable um, uh, candidates. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Nicholas, did you have anything to add in terms of, you know, what you would look for in a, in a strong applicant? I think everything that people have said is very true for geomatics as well. I think just in the geomatics, we ask you to write a one page um, statement around why you're interested in geomatics. So I think bringing in on what people have said around professionalism, curiosity and passion uh, in geomatics, it's really just demonstrating to us that you you understand what it is, you understand why you think it's important to your career uh, and why you know coming and doing the program would would benefit you uh, through your professional life. So. Um, just focusing on the particular, for all of the programs, really focusing on the strengths and interests in the particular program. A generic letter to all four programs is not going to get you very far. We need you to really think about the relevance of the in individual program to you uh, and then how it would benefit you in your career and, and what you could bring to the program. They're the sorts of things we want to see quite specific to each of the individual programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's excellent advice. I think whatever, whichever graduate program that you're applying to, make sure that you really focus and make it unique to uh, to that application. Sending out, you know, a, a cookie cutter application isn't gonna isn't gonna get you very far. Um, and it's really exciting to hear about you know the, the the diversity of candidates. You know, when speaking about people from so many different backgrounds coming coming into into forestry. Um, 
I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, once once people have have graduated, um, you know, could you each talk a little bit more about, you know, what those career paths look like? What are some of the example types of types of jobs that people would take on after after each program? Um, would, would anyone be kind enough to get started on, on that in terms of career outcomes? Harry, thanks. Well, I can start, Shane. So I work here in BC, so a lot of the work I do is with industry, with First Nations, with communities, and with government here. And honest, honestly, I run into graduates from our program constantly. They're working at senior levels in government. They're working for consulting firms. They're working across Canada. Some are overseas. Um, and, you know, it depends. You know, you can sort of pick whatever, you know, they're working on policy, they're working on developing operational plans, they're managing fiber supply, um, they're doing vulnerability assessments for cities, for, you know, so anything that, as I talked about earlier, forestry is a wide ranging field as you've got the sense from what everybody's presented here. And at least from my perspective, um, I can see them doing all those things. I'm happy to provide more detail on any of those, but we'd be here for a long time. <laughs> that's that's great but I, I know there's there's more there's more information on our, on our site soon and certainly um we will leave the email address um with, with you with the, with you as well so you, you can follow up with general questions um um into would you be able to jump jump in next and talk more yeah of course um a lot of our students um well some of them come go back to their home country but some others then they got some international work so the ones that i think um, quite interesting also is that they actually uh, able to even change career if they want to because some people uh, sometimes wanted to take um, another perspective when they're taking the mif program so a lot of the students are actually will uh, go back to their home country and some works for organization like WWF in Indonesia or WWF in Cameroon, for example, or they work with um, FAO in Ghana, for example. And another person is working with C4, the Center for International Forestry Research. And those kind of organizations are really, really looking for people who has this broad um, um, understanding of the land use change, uh, forest um, landscapes, also livelihoods of the communities in the in the area and so on and so forth and and we have people who is working for um for a paper company who's now going into very new viscose and things like that or new fiber and and very innovative way of doing things and and one of the big companies in sumatra for example now they're going into um uh, they're doing this restoration ecosystem work and one of our students who is a biologist he now works as their uh, sustainability officer, for example, because they are interested mm -hmm. in doing more restoration in their pulp and paper concession area. And then we have people working on a carbon market uh, firm in the US, for example. So it's very broad and a lot of the, all these are, there are some examples in the MIF websites and, and people can even contact our students and our past students if they, they, they're interested in that. And a lot of our students are basically, yeah, have, different interesting career paths so um, yeah it could be um, a lot of different things that that people might be interested in in understanding better what are the different career paths that they could get but, but it's really really wide right and with the mif program so that's great Thank, thanks Cindy. um can i i don't know if i cut you off before i don't know if you were going to jump in and talk after after harry spoke earlier did you have anything to, to add on this no, I, I mean, I think Harry described it really well. Um, you know, the, uh, I guess I could even add that uh, some MSFM grads have gone into uh, teaching as well, right, um, as mm -hmm. well. And, uh, you know, I, I run into MSFM grads all the time, uh, working with uh, industry and government. Um, and they're all, like, doing really well because they're, they're integrating um, the forestry skills that we give them with their prior experience, uh, like I said earlier, that uh, provides a value to employers that I think is uh, really, really exceeds, you know, somebody who's less experienced, maybe, um, you know, exploring forestry for the first time through a, a tech diploma or an undergrad. 
they're just bringing that richness of uh, life experience as well as what we provide them. That's great. Thanks. Um, uh, Cecil, could I pass it over to you to talk about your program? Sure, Shane, thanks. Um, of course, we are, because we are new, we haven't had any graduates yet, but uh, the program is designed really to uh, to get people into this kind of leadership positions, be the head of an urban forestry program, the head of a green infrastructure planning department in a city. Uh, it could be other types of government, it can also be consultancy or not for profits that are working on some kind of greening initiatives, uh, but really the kind of mid to higher leadership level uh, dealing with uh, with urban forest and urban green spaces um, and, and said so that the range of jobs that could be associated with that will be, will be pretty large uh, but typically i think uh, many people will aim for um, city or or town related jobs great uh, Nick nicholas can i pass it over to you yeah i mentioned some of the graduates in my um initial statement so um you know, I, People go um, to consulting companies, either they've, they've started a consulting company and then come and done MGEM and then gone back to the consulting company. Uh, a number go to government departments, be they sort of provincial or state departments or federal departments as well. We have people working for Parks Canada and Wildlife, um, the Wildlife Service, the Canadian Forest Service is where people have gone as well. Um, some People choose to stay at UBC uh, and do additional studies. So we've had some MGEM students that have continued their studies at UBC and gone to do a PhD. That's not a typical route to go into a PhD, but it is something that is that is not ruled out by doing a master's at UBC. So that's something that we've seen as well. And then some people stay at UBC to work as a researcher. So a number of research groups across UBC are interested in geomatic skills. And so they then employ a MGEM graduate as a researcher in their um, research group. So a, a really a very wide range of, um, of jobs and, and like the other programs as well, many of them overseas. So uh, not everyone stays in Vancouver, people return to their home countries, uh, home provinces or, or take that opportunity to go and work somewhere else as a result of the program. Um, there was also a comment uh, that I could pick up, Shane, just about the full time. So all the programs are full time and all of them are intensive. Um, these are very compressed programs to get you your master's in that period of time. And as you, as you all probably know, a research master's can take two years, three years. We're offering you master's in a, a 10 month program or a nine month program. So you, they are compressed and they are a lot of work. Um, so they run full time. We don't really encourage you, certainly in MGEM, to have another job. We don't believe you can maintain a job as well as do the expectations around the master's program. Even TAing uh, can be problematic uh, because there's a lot of travel in some cases and long field trips um, and just, just long hours associated with doing the master's. So it is compressed and it is hard work. We are um, cognizant of that, though, and, and we don't push you too hard. You have um, afternoons off, you have social events, which we coordinate for you. Uh, there's weekend events that each, um, each master's program has their own events that they organize internally to, to go and see different parts of Vancouver and enjoy the environment. So we do try to encourage work-life balance, um, despite the fact that it's an intensive program, um, but just bear that in mind. And so uh, don't overcommit to doing other things while you're doing your course-based masters because it is a it is an intense time in your life and you want to get most out of the program that you can so perhaps just um a word of advice uh, around that thank you yes excellent advice it's going to be a, a it's going to be hard work it's going to be intense for the for the year or so that, that you're with us um there's some some more questions coming in but what before i before i jump back at those i just wanted to ask um the, the program directors um you know, we've talked a little bit today about experiential learning, um, about how with the, you know that's something that seems to be happening in all of your of your programs. Um, would you be would you each be able to give a, an example of um, you know, what that would look like in your your program, like something experiential that a that a student would get the chance to do, um, as part of your program? Um, you know, Nicholas, could you could maybe you could start us off again on that? Yeah, I mean, MGEM is is quite um. 
computer focused and, and data processing focused. So we would probably be the least of the experimental uh, experiential uh, learnings, but we do go into the forest, we fly drones. I mentioned the retreat that we go on all together. Uh, there are site visits. We go to different organizations that are using a lot of geospatial data, for example, government departments in Vancouver. Um, and some of the classes have exercises outside for um, learning about these different geospatial skills. Uh, but of the four, we are probably the one with the least uh, I could pass to into, uh, perhaps which is one with the most. <laughs> yes, thanks, Nicholas. Yes, a lot of the, uh, our program is actually a lot of experiential learning uh, all year long, I could say, because we have a lot of um, guests coming. They could be coming from um, um, indigenous uh, organization, or they could be coming from the communities. They could be coming from private sector or even a consulting company. So one of the students last year did her internship with KPMG, one of the, because the, the, the headquarter for the forestry program for auditing forest companies is in Vancouver. So then after that, the student got a job straight away with Waste Fraser, for example. And then we have students doing their internship in FAO office in Ghana. And, and um, we have a lot of colleagues uh, that we know from our past work in Africa. So we have a lot of experience in different parts of the world in Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, South America, and so on and so forth. And we even have a student who is working with the Médecins Sans Frontières, the Doctors Without Border, and she sees the importance of natural resources with, within these um, refugee camps, for example, in, in Sudan or in Syria, where I also used to work with um, some of these different organizations like UNHCR. So there are a lot of links between forest landscapes, health, economics, culture, everything, and, and so on and so forth. So a lot of our students will be able to learn a lot from a lot of our guests, and we will be bringing students as well uh, during the, 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 the program. So uh, during the, the program, when, we, when students are in Vancouver, we take them to interior British Columbia, we take them to Vancouver Island, and, then, um, and, and after that, the students can choose to do their directed studies or internship or research projects with different uh, colleagues of ours or different partners in different parts of the world. So it all depends on the interest of the students whether if they want to work with um, NGOs, whether if they want to work with local government or with private sector and so on and so forth in which part of the world. So yeah, a lot of the students is really completely diverse. Yeah, so, um, so uh, it all depends on each um, student, uh, which kind of trajectory they want to choose. So yeah. a lot happening, that's, hey. that's fascinating. Yeah, Harry, I just would like on behalf of the MSFM program, you know, this is basically built into the program. I mean, I would kind of, we get students out on field trips to see the forest, to see communities. Also built into it are the things where you actually work with, um, I guess, real world clients. You know, this year we're working with an indigenous community up in the interior. We're working with a community out in kind of a bit to their Northeast, where you're helping develop forest management plans for them. So there is very much that kind of direct participation because it's you know the best preparation for what you may be doing or at least be aware of what goes into that when you go you know when you're going to leave the program. So definitely we we're, we're, we do a lot of it and I think we'd like to do even more of it. And if I if I can jump in as well, Shane, briefly on on the Muffle, which is an online program, but actually in our capstone project, which is the final project, and it's quite some time reserved for it. Uh, students will work with the clients, so that could be a, a city that needs a new urban forestry strategy, that could be a, a city that's interested in an urban, urban agricultural program, it could be an NGO that wants to, for example, see if they can do a campaign around tree planting. So there'll be a lot of opportunities there to also bring in that experiential uh, component. And we're actually also designing um, a, a field trip, um, which will be part of the program, and that could be a location in Europe, for example, where students have a chance to, to meet up and put their, their experience in practice. Wonderful. That's excellent. Thanks everyone for that for that overview. Um, and Harry, I'm just wondering if you could um, answer that question from Annie. Um, just asks about her background in molecular population genetics. Is there a potential career post the MSFM that will allow um, them to use their genetic skills as well as get outside more often? <laughs> 
So Annie, I think there's going to be a long answer. You probably have to email me, but the short answer, you know, and again, this comes back to what we're doing here in British Columbia. You know, we're doing a lot of work with um, essentially starting to develop climate assisted kind of uh, planting schemes and strategies. And so that I know I work with the provincial government on this. And so part of that is developing, I think, both than having the scientific knowledge as well as a practical knowledge about how might you translate that out to um, how that would lay out on the land. So my guess is, you know, there is one possibility. There are seed orchards. There's other ways of doing it. So, yeah. But please feel free to email me to kind of, um, you know, want more possibilities, I guess. Excellent. Thanks, Harry. Um, great questions and thank thanks to the panelists for, for answering all of these this is a final call for questions so we've just got a few minutes to go so if you if you do have any final questions now's the time to type them in um for our panel let us know before we we, we wrap things up in, in a few minutes um just while we wait to see if any more um questions come in and um, if i could just ask the panel a, another one from me which i think um sometimes people you know overlook this but what, what are some you know tips on on being successful once you arrive at a graduate school because we talk a lot about you know how to get your application strong and you know which program is right but you know once you've been accepted once you arrive um at ubc vancouver what are some tips on just you know being successful and making the most of your time at the at the graduate level. Would anyone have any tips? I, I think, I Jane, oh. if I could, I would go back and I would, I mean, first I'm gonna to have to accuse myself because I'm gonna to have to go in four minutes, but Ken can answer on behalf of the program. But it's as Nicholas said, this is a um, intensive program. We've done everything we can, regardless of which one you pick to give you the materials you think to succeed. But just become prepared to kind of make that your focus. Um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. You'll get a lot out of it in the classic, of course, you know, you'll need to put that work into it to get that much out of it. Um, organization, patience, and kind of um, focus. I like it. Thank you. Thanks. Harry. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in, uh, Harry, yeah. that's OK, or Shane. So I think uh, definitely I'd come, I'd come with full focus. This is a big decision for many, for many of you to come and do a master's, an intensive master's. Uh, come with passion and be willing to, uh, to get the best out of it, the most out of it. And that means interacting with your professors, but also with your peers, uh, with the other students. And I think if you have that attitude, um, that there's really a lot to be, be gained from these four programs that are all really super high quality. Thanks, Cecil. Maybe I can add, um, well, I guess for the MIA program, um, I, I'm hoping that they, 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 there would be a lot of opportunities um, during, during the year when, when students are at UBC. And there they, they are a lot of um, guests coming from different parts of the world, from different interesting organizations. And basically, like Nicholas Stubb said, um, that there might be no time for, for you to, to do TAs or work in other things because it is a very intensive program, right? But, but take all these opportunities and don't hesitate to jump on these different uh, occasions where you can meet and build network while people are at UBC. And it's also be open-minded, I guess, uh, learning together. Uh, those are different ways of learning um, more, um, yeah, with a better way of understanding others and things like that. So. I guess that's um, for me, yeah. Thanks, Inti. Uh, Nicholas or Ken, did you have anything to add to this one? Uh, no, I and uh, just uh, reiterating what Harry said. Time management really important. It's a, a you know really intensive program. Also, you're going to get. Uh, you know, lectures and guest lectures from leaders in industry and in government and also in the faculty itself. So uh, take advantage of those uh, contacts uh, because uh, forestry is a small world and in many cases, you'll be revisited in them over and over. By all, please email me. You'll find Sorry. my email if you have any further questions about the MSFM program or Ken. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Um, 
and yeah, I just want to say thank you to, to all of our, our, our panelists. Um, I don't think we have any any new questions that have that have come in here. So I think we can um, you know wrap things up. I think it's been it's been really great. I think we've been able to answer a large number of questions. So thank you all um, for for your time today. I know that we're going to um, follow up by by email. Um, shortly so we'll send you the um the recording and some useful useful links um so you can read read more on our on our web pages and um and yeah i think i think we've we've covered quite a lot i hope it's been helpful and um yeah we will hope to see you at ubc vancouver soon so i'll say thanks everyone goodbye for now thanks everybody Bye, Thank everyone you. thanks for being there